I think filmmaking is hard and I think filmmaking is fun and it's exciting and it's a direction in which the culture is going video is like video consumption keeps growing and growing and growing and growing in the internet so for us as a discipline to not embrace it fully is folly <laughs> Alexandra Hidalgo is an assistant professor at Michigan State University. Her research deals with film and video production, film studies, gender, race, immigration, and memoirs. She's also an award-winning documentary filmmaker. Her films have been recognized and screened around the world. I sat down to talk with Alexandra about her journey as a feminist filmmaker, how video is being incorporated into the field of rhetoric and writing, and how we can become and support future filmmakers. My family is a family of storytellers, but we were for the most part writers. Um, my grandmother was a pretty successful writer in Spain and the US actually and Venezuela in between the 30s and the 50s. And my dad was an unsuccessful writer in uh, the 70s. Um, so when I was growing up, what I wanted to be was a writer. Like that was the thing for me. My dad disappeared in the Venezuelan Amazon when I was six. Um, so I had spent a lot of time sort of trying to make sense of, um, well, who he was and sort of trying to, what happened to him and so on. So I have spent, I don't know, most of my adult life in some way or another sort of being dedicated to this. So my dad is a big sort of, has always been a big driving force for me, as you know. A human being. He was great and magical and you know we were very close um, so when he disappeared that was a profoundly traumatic thing and of course then there was nobody and there was nothing it was just like we didn't even know if he was dead we thought like that he just like some people were like oh he ran off with some woman I mean there were all these stories so it became a very defining moment and it was a story that I remember it happened when I was six and I remember telling my mom I want to write a book about this. Paso por we had had cameras growing up, so like, I mean, I had held a camcorder and so on, but, um, and I liked them and I remembered sort of, but it never, it had never occurred to me that I could potentially make films until I found myself not having enough time to write this piece about my dad during the PhD. Um, but also having a desperate need for that creative storytelling aspect of my being to find a place in my new life. Well, I'm, I'm a pretty like um, intuitive person and I make decisions very rashly. So like I was 20 years old and my best friend was like, I met this guy and he's like perfect for you. He should be the love of your life. And I was dating a filmmaker then or I had just broken up with him. And I was like, no, filmmaker guy. I'm still sort of thinking about him. And she was like, no, I'm just going to have you like meet this guy because he's great. He's like amazing. And I walked in through the door and I was like, oh, yeah, that one. That's the one. And like that was on a Wednesday. And by Saturday, we were living together and we've been together, I mean, that was 1999, and it's 2017, 18 years, two children later. So film was sort of like that. Like, I, I went to talk to my advisor, because I was like, oh, I think I want to do film. Uh, and she was like, well, Shirley Rose was my advisor, mentor at the time. And she was like, we don't just do, you're not, you can't do film studies. That wouldn't make any sense for us. If you want to do film, you should make movies. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Like all filmmakers, Alexandra's enthusiasm for the genre helped her to overcome technical hurdles and frustrations, allowing her camera work and editing skills to improve over time. I'm from Venezuela. I have lived here since I was uh, 16 years old, and I have this set of feminist friends here. I have this set of feminist friends there, and uh, the feminist friends here would never get breast implants because that would be so weird. But the feminist friends there all have them. And that's always been very confusing to me because I, I, plastic surgery seems weird to me. Um, so I was like, 
if I'm gonna make a movie, I should like do it about something that I'm actually literally super curious about. So I was like, I'll just like go to Venezuela for 10 days and find some Venezuelans and ask them about their boobs and see what they tell me. Um, so that's what I did. I like. Didn't know. I, I read it in the newspaper that for the Miss Venezuela contest, they 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 give you liposuctions not only on the thighs and the butt or everything, but also on the knees. And then I started looking at my knees and obsessing about them. And now I I discovered that I, that I have fat on my knees. <laughs> Um, and off I went, and, well, not surprisingly, it turned out I was a very good interviewer because I had had many years of practice interviewing people, um, so I was a hell of an interviewer, got incredible responses, and I didn't know what I was doing with the camera. <laughs> um, so, the film's fine, like, the, it's, it's interesting, like, it's the, ah. Uh, the responses are so fascinating. It's in English, it's in Spanish. I love it. Um, and I also hate it because it sounds bad. It looks tacky. Like, it doesn't look, yeah, it just looks like, yes, it looks like somebody picked up a camera and made a movie and had some decent instincts and also had no idea what she was doing. But that film taught me is that um, I did have some strengths and those strengths were wonderful. But that I needed to figure out the technical stuff and that it was going to be a rough road. And that unlike writing, which had always been my gig, you can't fix bad footage. So you can actually take the stuff that you wrote and be like, oh God, that's really bad prose. And then, you know, 12 hours later, walk away with good prose. Um, that is impossible to do with footage. I, like now that I know more, I'm like, we could have fixed some of it, but we could have never made it great. Lucky for us, Alexandra shares the knowledge she acquired as she made mistakes in her new book, Camera Rhetorica, a feminist filmmaking methodology for rhetoric and composition, where she includes a section on the basic fundamentals of shooting film. I, it's funny because I was somebody who had seen a million films. Like, I have always loved films. I have watched films. Um, I'm a very visual person. I like photography. I had taken a lot of great photos. So I continued to be quite surprised when I started editing the footage that somebody with that kind of a background would shoot footage that was so awful. <laughs> and that I could hardly, f I mean, I fixed some of it, but ultimately, um, it's not great. Um, and I think that happens to a lot of us. And I feel like if we at least are made aware that these are pitfalls that we can eventually trip ourselves over, we'll be more likely to not do it. Like I wish, I honestly, I made that section for my younger self. Like I was like, oh, Alex, if you could have seen this, if this had existed before you went to Venezuela, you could have seen it then Perfect would be a much better movie. I asked Alexandra what her best advice was for people who want to create films, but have no experience using a camera or editing video footage. There's a few things that one can do. One of my favorite uh, options is to just go out and do something for your family or for you know, the dog kennel that you volunteer for. So like you're gonna be like, oh, we're all getting together for the book club that I'm part of. Let me make like a little video about this conversation. And you know, if it didn't work, it doesn't matter because it's super low stakes. There's like nothing to worry about and I'm gonna have some fun and sort of make something. So that's one approach. One approach is to do some low stakes, sort of no. Um, but even with the low stakes ones, you should, watch some videos online that give you tips for filming and know that you are gonna watch the videos and you're gonna think that you got it and then you're not you're just like gonna be like oh no I actually didn't listen to that right or I didn't do right or but next time I will because it was so painful to see it all go to hell um so and but then you still have to learn how to use edit footage and this is where I don't know if my advice is popular or not but you know, I would just learn the best software. Like, so I would learn Adobe Premiere.
because that's the that's the software that actually will work at all levels and it, there's a little bit of a higher learning curve but I've had to go from like Final Cut 7 which took me about 80 hours to learn to then Final Cut X which took me about 30 hours to learn to now Premiere which took me about 30 more hours to learn and I'm like no no just 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 spend the 80 hours on their Premiere because it, the, the difference is just a few more hours <laughs> the first time around so and how do you learn it I did lynda.com they have wonderful tutorials. Um, I don't need those now. Now I just like bug my filmmaking friends to like give me a little bit of, I'm like, so, okay, how do you set it up and how do you want? And then I like write down questions for stuff that's driving me nuts. And then I'm like, give me 15 minutes of your time and answer these questions for me. And then I take notes. But I mean, there's enough videos out there that one can, and always, I hate, like always use video tutorials, not written tutorials, because the video tutorials you can like literally follow through as opposed to sit around. Um, and if a tutorial seems kind of lame, don't use that one, use another one. The other thing is to collaborate with somebody who knows. In terms of gear, there are basics. And the basics is, the basics are, you need a camera, and uh, I have a Lumix camera that's wonderful. Um, it, it's a Panasonic, it does 4K footage, it does incredible photography, and that was like $700, so that's actually not bad. You have to have a shotgun mic. The minimum, the bare minimum is a shotgun mic on top of your camera, because the cameras come with Omni mics, and those pick up everything. The shotgun is unidirectional. The shotgun is unidirectional, so that will at least like pick up what you're pointing at. So you need those. Um, you definitely need an extra battery. Um, you just do. And you need a camera bag. And you need a tripod. So that investment to actually a really nice setup with those things, that's about $1,200. Um, and what I always tell my students, I want to tell people on like all Christmases, all birthdays, you say can I please have cash because I'm saving up for this? All those times that you are like at Starbucks and you want, no, 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 take that money and save it. In addition to providing pragmatic advice about how to get started making films, I also talked to Alexandra about the significance of feminist filmmaking. Filmmaking is, um, well, like most interesting industries, profoundly male-dominated. It wasn't, mind you. Like in the 20s, the studios had a lot of women writing, editing, directing, sort of Alice Guy Blaschet was like running the studios. She was, there was all sorts of uh, activity by women. And then once the um, film started really making money, the women got pushed out because that's usually how it works. So I do think um, that having, it's about 90% of the stories filmic stories, which are very powerful stories, being created by men is an issue because these stories shape us. I mean, we all know this. They shape who, who we are and how we think and who we want to be and what we think the world is like. And women are 50% of the population and 15% and of the films should be made by women. Like that, just because that would make it, um, that would provide a great variety of perspective that we desperately need. And I think we'd be a much more egalitarian and um, kind world, if that was the case. Um, so for me, part of feminist filmmaking is I'm going to support women making films because we need those stories. So I, you know, have mostly, I mean, except for my husband, who's my cinematographer and a great feminist, um, I try to work almost exclusively with women and um, I work a lot with students, which means that I can actually afford to work with them. It's now I write grants and I'm able to pay them, but I'm not able to pay at the level that a studio would pay. Um, 
So there's a trade-off, right? Like I work with them and they um, are more affordable, but I also like have to do a lot more mentoring and hand-holding than I would otherwise, but I love it. Like I love that feeling of like, oh, okay, I made this movie, but then I also like created these beautiful relationships with these people who taught me a bunch of stuff and then I taught them stuff and then I get to see their careers grow. So I think, especially for people who are working as independent filmmakers or people who are academics making films, working with the like uh, younger, less experienced filmmakers is a great deal. And then I also feel like my sets, once I learned how to run a set, and I know how to run a set, um, are pretty sort of like, sort of feminist spaces where your opinion is listened to, your needs are uh, taken into account. So it doesn't mean that every single thing you want will happen on the set because a set's not like that. But I try really hard for everybody to feel valued and to have a voice. And I'm like, oh, so these students work in these sets and then they go on to have their own sets and it spreads this more humane and and I think it makes the films better anyway. So I do a lot of um, try. So when I run a set and I run it with young people, I have a feeling that I'm also helping shape the sets of the future that are not mine, that are theirs. I think filmmaking is hard. And I think filmmaking is fun. And it's exciting and it's a direction in which the culture is going. Video is like video consumption keeps growing and growing and growing and growing in the internet. So for us as a discipline to not embrace it fully is folly. <laughs> no. We need to actually we need I think Yes, it's hard, but there's more and more of us doing it, and there's plenty of places to publish, and your first couple things don't have to be great, but you'll get better, um, and you learn how to like collaborate with others, and you learn how to write grants so that people pay, will cover the cost of what you're doing, and um, it's a very like complex and uh, full way of engaging with the ideas of others and with your own. And I think we need to do it. Go make movies. Yay. <laughs>